Hey, everybody. Welcome to True Crime Freaks, my new podcast. I want to tell you about the different ways you can support this podcast. One is you can go to my other podcast, Lights, Camera Pro, where I interview TV and film professionals about their careers. And I also do movie reviews and TV show reviews. You can check out one of my online courses. I've got an Adobe Premiere Basics course and a Secrets of How to Start a Podcast course. Those are at thinkific.com. Just search them when you go there. We also have a merch store. Just search the podcast at teespring.com and check out our hoodies, t-shirts, and mugs. I also have a children's book called Feldman Runs Away, which is on amazon.com. You can always support the podcast by going to Apple or Spotify, wherever you listen, subscribe, rate, and review. This podcast does have graphic content. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks, everybody. She wants to find a party and have some fun. Her friend wasn't in the mood. She ended up at a frat party alone, kissing a boy and bringing him into the bathroom. She was seen passed out drunk on the neighbor's lawn outside the party. Two students who knew her offered to get her home. She never made it home. This is the disappearance of Kristen Smart. This podcast is based on information and articles from KET News, KCRA 3, 48 Hours, and the Your Own Backyard podcast. So Kristen really wanted to go out on Memorial Day weekend. She stayed on campus. She went to Cal Poly, Kristen Smart, and she had told her mom that she wasn't really having a good time there. She didn't enjoy being there. She had made a lot of friends, but she was going to go out with the next door neighbor, the the woman in the next dorm, Margarita. Margarita didn't really want to go out. She wanted to sleep and hang out and probably watch TV. And Kristen was adamant about going out. She's like, come on, let's go out. It'll be fun. And finally, she convinces Margarita to go out. I, you know, whatever. I, I went out with you before. Why don't you go out with me? That kind of thing. So they find a bunch of guys and gals in a truck, big pickup truck, and they get in it. They say they're going to a party. Um, they're just walking around. They find this this truck. And yeah, come on in, come and go to the party. So they go to this party and it's just a bunch of boys playing video games and Margarita isn't having it. And eventually Kristen's like, yeah, let's get out of here. So they walk around some more, they're right by campus. They're a little bit off campus. They're looking for parties. They can't find anything because it's Memorial Day weekend. And most of the students of Cal Poly have gone home and Margarita is just not having it. She's like, I want to go back to the dorm. I don't want to go out anymore. Please come back to the dorm with me. And Kristen is, she just has to go out. So she just goes, uh, that's fine. I'm going to go off and find a party by myself. So I'm not here to blame anyone in this podcast, but I have two daughters who are going to college and I would hope this would never happen to them if You know, you're in college and you go out with a friend, you stay out with that friend or you both are smart enough to agree to go back together. Like if somebody wants to stay out, someone wants to come in, you flip a coin, whatever you have to do, but you stay together. You don't let people go off alone. And this was, um, you know, seconded by um, this woman artist who was talking about, you know, being alive in LA during the Hillside Strangler and the Night Stalker. I did an interview with her last week. And even before the Night Stalker, which, you know, made her friends have four and six people at a time go out together and hopefully with a guy, because they were all scared of the Night Stalker. Um, even before that, she always had the buddy system growing up in the in the early 70s or the late 60s, I'm not sure probably late 60s they always had the buddy system in high school and in college 
before all this stuff went down with the Night Stalker. So grab a buddy and stay out or go home together. Don't ever leave anybody alone. So Margarita goes back to the dorm and Kristen finds a frat party. And according to Chris Lambert in the Your Own Backyard podcast, um, there's this guy, Trevor Belcher, and he was at the frat party and he noticed Kristen there. And it was for an old friend, it was his birthday, it was between 20 and 40 people, according to Trevor throughout the night, not a lot of people for a frat party. And he was just sitting there and Kristen walked up to him and gave him a kiss on the lips. And he was like, whoa, what's going on? Then she grabbed him and pulled him into the bathroom. And he was like, what is happening? Are we going to fool around? Like, what is going on? And she just told him to wait there for a second. And some people have speculated that It was because she was trying to make this other tall basketball player jealous. But the one strange thing is that she introduced herself to everyone at the party as Roxy, not Kristen. Um, So Kristen leaves. Trevor comes out of the bathroom. When he comes out, this guy confronts him and says, what did you do with her in the bathroom? And it turns out that that was Paul Flores. And as you'll see, as this podcast goes on, Paul Flores is is the last person to see Kristen alive and the main suspect in the case. So Trevor was like, whoa, dude, I didn't do anything with her. What's happening? And essentially saying, are you the boyfriend? And Paul didn't respond. And he was just like, that was weird. But he remembered Paul. Okay, so... You can look up the full names of these people if you want to research um, the Kristen Smart case, but I'm just going to use their first names. Outside the frat party, Kristen was passed out on a neighbor's lawn lying on the ground. A bunch of people noticed her there. And there was this guy, Tim, and this woman, Cheryl, and they decided that they were going to help Kristen home. They didn't really know her, but they had seen her around campus. So... um, Kristen was a big girl. She was like six foot one, very tall. And so they kind of helped her up and noticed that she couldn't walk on her own. She was so drunk. So she had obviously, you know, been drinking a lot. And and later on um, in the Your Own Backyard podcast, we learned that she was very, very shy in high school. And this was probably one of the first times she just kind of let loose and got really intoxicated. So Tim and Cheryl are walking her home and Tim lives off campus and they're sort of struggling with her getting her to the dorm room and Chris Lambert from the Your Own Backyard podcast said, and I'll just refer to him in the future as Chris, uh, he said that it took him about 11 minutes to walk from the frat party house to her dorm. So a guy catches up to them. And he says, hey, can I help? And it turns out to be Paul Flores. And it's a little weird because they notice that he's putting his hands around rather than underneath like one of her arms or her shoulder. He's putting his hands around her waist and holding up Kristen that way. And Kristen has on like a half shirt, like a shirt that has her stomach exposed and he's holding her stomach. It's a little creepy and a little weird. But they're all just kind of trying to get out of there and get home. So Tim lives off campus he's like can you guys get her home it's not you know it's a few minutes up the road here and they're like yeah sure paul's like yeah sure Cheryl's like sure so tim leaves and then when they get only a couple hundred feet from Kristen's dorm cheryl <clears throat> says can you get her the rest of the way i live up here so i'm going to take a left paul says sure i can get her home just give me a kiss before you go to Cheryl, which is really weird because he's holding up this drunk woman who is, you know, so intoxicated that she can't walk herself. And he takes the time to try and kiss the other woman that's there, which is crazy. And she says, no, no, no. And then he just keeps going. He's like, okay, well, can you give me a kiss on the cheek before you go? All the time while holding Christian. No, 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 I don't want to. Well, can you give me a hug? No, I'm good. Well, can, 
you know, you shake my hand or he just keeps going. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm goodbye. And she just walks away and doesn't look back, which once again, I'm going to say that don't ever leave a drunk woman with a guy who's kind of creepy and trying to kiss you or at least call the police or something or call the campus police something. Uh, There's so many instances in this case where people just sort of, you know, didn't do anything. They just sort of went home and were like, all right, well, you get home. And and in their defense, maybe this kind of stuff doesn't happen very often in San Luis Obispo, California. But still, I, I just don't think it's a good practice to leave people alone with creepy guys. So I've listened to the entire podcast of Your Own Backyard with Chris Lambert. And you should all listen to it. It's eight episodes. It's very in-depth. He took several years to research it. He did hundreds of interviews. He looked at police records. He looked at phone records. And it's much more complete than this podcast. This covers it in one podcast. And I just did this podcast because there's some updates that we are going to share at the end. And we had discussed it in... Um, the clubhouse group that I have on Saturday nights at eight uh, called true crime discussion group with Jennifer Parker and Danielle Middleton. You should check it out, but uh, that's eight o'clock Eastern time. But what I'm saying is, is to get really deep into this case, listen to the own your own backyard podcast. Um, this is just a kind of an overview. So Paul's side of the story is that he left Kristen at her dorm door. So he just left her there a couple hundred feet from the dorm and just walked away. Um, There is the theory by many that he actually took her to his dorm room, raped her and killed her, then called his dad who helped him dispose of the body. And I can say that now. I I wanted to say that this was speculation before, but as of this recording of this podcast on April 29th, 2021, Paul Flores and his dad, Ruben Flores, have both been arrested for the murder of Kristen Smart, and the father's been arrested as an accessory, as, as if he you know, helped move the body in the middle of the night, like many people suspect. Okay, so I'm not going to read this whole thing. This is the Smart Family Statement. They've been looking for their daughter for 24 years. I'm not going to read this entire statement from the Smart Family, but just the first paragraph. For over 24 years, we have waited for this bittersweet day. It is impossible to put into words what this means for our family. We prayed as the first step to bringing our daughter home. While Kristen's loving spirit will always live in our hearts, our life without her hugs, laughs, and smiles is a heartache that never abates. The knowledge that a father and son, despite our desperate pleas for help, could have withheld this horrible secret for nearly 25 years, denying us the chance to lay our daughter to rest, is an unrelenting and unforgiving pain. We now put our faith in the justice system and move forward, comforted in the knowledge that Kristen has been held in the hearts of so many and that she has not been forgotten. You can find the rest of this statement at the Kristen Smart Facebook page. There is so much more to this story. If you want to go deep into it, Chris Lambert's podcast, Your Own Backyard, has gotten over 75 million downloads and a lot of people have listened to this, which has brought a lot of evidence to the case, a lot of tips and information. There are a couple more things that I'll tell you about. I wish I had more time to go deep into this, but Chris has done a much better job than I'll ever do. So I'll just let you go and check out his podcast. But I will tell you some information that I just got from listening to the last couple of episodes. There was a witness the night Kristen disappeared and he was an exchange student who was 30. I believe he lived in Australia and he went home, but um, the Cal Poly campus police took a statement from him and it was just sort of blown off. But Chris had found this guy and he said that he was riding his bike by what would have been Kristen Smart's dorm at the time. 
and he saw a tall woman who was taller than this guy who was about 5'10". The woman was about six feet. He saw them both with their hands in the air, pushing each other back and forth. And it wasn't like a boyfriend, girlfriend or a friend thing horsing around. It was it was violent and aggressive and it didn't look right. So he, he rode back on his bicycle, saw that for about five seconds at about 2.30 in the morning when they had arrived at the dorms, according to the timeline, and he just kept riding. I hope if you ever see anything like this that doesn't look right, I mean, this guy could have saved this woman's life, possibly we'll never know. If you ever see anything on a campus or outside of a campus at a party that doesn't look right, like a, a kid passed out or people fighting or hitting each other, please call the police. Please call your parents. Do something. Don't just go home and go to bed. So this is a really interesting thing that happened to me because just like Chris Lambert, um, following this case and getting deeper, I was very, very frustrated with the Cal Poly campus police and also the San Luis Obispo police. And it felt like they really hadn't done anything since 2011. But Chris gets access to these two investigators on the case, one of them who's a cold case detective that has broken a lot of cold cases and is very smart. And he finds out that really since 2011, these police officers have been working on this case every single day. They've used hundreds of man hours, found 140 pieces of evidence, done eight or nine search warrants, and done tons of interviews. So the police are working and the police are doing things, but it seems like they're not doing anything because they're not communicating to the public, but they have to do this stuff in private so that they can break the case. They can't let certain details come out. So I do feel much better about the San Luis Obispo Police Department, especially now that Paul and Ruben have been arrested, that there's been more searches, there's been more um, information that's come out, and, and I feel much, much better. But I was very frustrated for several episodes of the podcast with the police department and definitely, you know, everybody knows that kind of like some religious organizations, campuses would take care of their own problems. If there was a rape, if there was a missing person, it took them weeks to get to the police because they wanted to figure it out amongst themselves. But really what they were trying to do is hide the story. So people don't stop, you know, people don't stop going to Cal Poly and just go to other schools. They want to make money. So now they have a law. It's actually Kristen Smart Act. It's not the exact name, but it's a law that basically says that, you know, if there's a missing person or or some sort of rape or, or someone gets hurt, you know, a physical encounter, they, that the campus has to report that to the police. Okay, so the last thing that came out of the podcast um, when Chris interviews these investigators, and they don't they don't admit to it but he actually goes to the place where the vehicles are, the trucks. So the Flores family had two trucks. They had a white, uh, I believe Nissan pickup truck and a green, Paul had a green Ford Ranger pickup truck. And a year after the disappearance, both of those vehicles were gone. Even though Paul's was only four years old, it wasn't even five years old. And the other truck was very old, but they got rid of it because one of those trucks are believed to have moved the body. But what nobody knew, except for Chris figured out from a tip, is that both of those trucks are now in the possession of the San Luis Obispo Police Department. And they are impounded. And the way Chris explained it is that the way DNA is today, that if there is a pinhead of Kristen Smart's DNA in one of those trucks, essentially this case would blow wide open and they can find that in those trucks. Even though it's 25 years later, they're just looking for a pinhead of DNA. 
this is one of the things that I've always been frustrated about. And I, I thank Chris Lambert for explaining it because I'm always frustrated with how slow the investigations are in, in many disappearances and hundreds of murders. Um, and the reason why they're so slow is because of this. And, and Chris explained it this way. So a murder investigation is a 10,000 piece puzzle. In every single agency, there's several agencies, the, the police, the sheriff, the FBI, the DA, the Justice Department, lawyers, etc. And every agency has maybe 500 pieces or 1,000 pieces or 1,500 pieces. Not everybody has the same pieces and not everybody is sharing all the information. And even if they do share all the information, not everybody goes through all the information. So the interesting thing was... Chris Lambert has a podcaster, as a person who is obsessed with this case because he grew up in the area where Kristen went missing and saw a billboard every day when he was a young kid. Um, he had the benefit of talking to all those agencies. He didn't get information from all of them. He didn't get information from the uh, sheriff's department for years. But he got some information from them, and then t he interviewed people. He interviewed the smarts. He interviewed witnesses. He interviewed people who knew Paul Flores in high school, in college. So he put all that information together, and he put in timelines, and he cross-referenced it, and probably had more information by himself than all of the agencies combined. And by doing this podcast over two or three years and having 75 million downloads. He brought a lot of attention to the case, which brought out new people giving new tips, possibly new witnesses. And even one of the investigators in the case said, your podcast was very helpful to this investigation because we followed tips that were on your podcast. We listened to your podcast and found out information that we didn't know. So this guy was helping the police department and now that Paul and Ruben have been arrested, we'll see what happens. We'll see who goes to jail. We'll see what evidence they have now. But on social media, they said there were court documents that they found evidence of a body that was under Ruben Flores' porch and that it had been moved. So there was evidence that a dead body was under this guy's porch, which is probably Kristen going to put all the information together a lot of it's circumstantial but they're going to go to trial and we'll see what happens and maybe justice will be served after 25 years but thank you to not only chris lambert but the smart family um, everybody involved all the agencies the police departments the lawyers uh, the FBI, everyone who has helped out in this case obviously they never gave up and it looks like justice will hopefully be served. And if you have any tips, any information about the Krista Smart case that you want to share, and even if you want to share anonymously, you can go to the yourownbackyardpodcast.com under contact and send in an anonymous tip if you would like to do so. Thanks for listening, guys. See you next week in the next chilling episode of True Crime Freaks, You Freaks. Thanks so much. Sean signing off. Hey everybody, welcome to True Crime Freaks, my new podcast. I want to tell you about the different ways you can support this podcast. One is you can go to my other podcast, Lights Camera Pro, where I interview TV and film professionals about their careers. And I also do movie reviews and TV show reviews. You can check out one of my online courses. I've got an Adobe Premiere Basics course and a Secrets of How to Start a Podcast course. Those are at thinkific.com. Just search them when you go there. We also have a merch store. Just search the podcast at teespring.com and check out our hoodies, t-shirts, and mugs. I also have a children's book called Feldman Runs Away, which is on amazon.com. You can always support the podcast by going to Apple or Spotify, wherever you listen, subscribe, rate, and review. This podcast does have graphic content. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Joseph McDade for the music. I will see you next time in the next chilling story on True Crime Freaks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great day. I'm Sean Ventura. Take care. Oh.